evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Apologies for being slightly delayed. Um, it is a weekday, and I know a lot of you are still getting off work. Um, welcome to today's discussion um, at the London School of Economics uh, on building a better future for the people of Afghanistan. A moral, a more moral, uh, a more cruel politics. Apologies. Um, since seizing power in August 2021, the Taliban de facto authorities um, has renounced the former government's constitution. And the state governance now operates without any formal legal and uh, administrative structure. Anything less than the nation's constitutional rights would signal a colossal historical failure and will open the doors for a new phase of conflict, <coughs> potentially even separatist movements. Afghanistan has experienced nearly half a century of serious disruption and war, encompassing, amongst other things, the substantial collapse of the instrumentalities of the state, uh, and this can be hardly overemphasized. Tonight, we're here to discuss what Afghanistan's future looks like and how we can begin to build an alternative. But before we get into any of this, uh, allow me to turn to Darius Msimi, who is the Head of Funding and Partnerships at the Afghanistan and Central Asian Association, and uh, he will introduce the organization that is hosting today's discussion uh, and the work it's been delivering over the past 25 years, both in the UK and in Afghanistan. So uh, good evening. Um, first of all, thank you very much for attending today's conference, um, which is about building a better future for the people of Afghanistan. And I, I thought it would be useful if I just gave a brief introduction um, about the Afghanistan and Central Asian Association, who is the organizer of today's conference. So. The Afghanistan and Central Asian Association is a charity that was founded 25 years ago after Dr. Nassimi arrived to the UK as a refugee to escape persecution from the Taliban in 1999. It was a very difficult and dangerous journey across Europe and eventually we arrived in the southeast of London in a place called Lewisham, which is where the charity was founded. And the main aim is to help um, refugees with integration. So we offer a wide range of services for the community. We've got English classes for adults um, to break down language barriers. We've got Saturday school for children to help them with their school subjects. Free legal advice on housing, immigration and family issues. Women's empowerment, so empowering refugee and migrant women who are vulnerable and very isolated from society, employment support, CV development, helping refugees with finding a job or with setting up a small business because there are lots of people who were running businesses back home. Some of them were running successful ones as well. They've got the idea but they don't know how to write a business plan, how to apply for a small loan, how to deal with all the legal paperwork like signing the leads or finding a solicitor. So we offer one-to-one -one mentoring and coaching um, to, to those individuals. And then we've got mental health and counselling, which I'm sure you can understand is a very important service for people who are fleeing countries like Afghanistan and other conflict zones. Sports activities for young people. So we launched a girls football club in Hounslow, funded by Comic Relief. A girls cricket club as well in Hounslow, funded by Sport England, and other fitness programs for both children and for the elderly. And then I think events are a very key part of the charity's work. So we hold conferences like this basically on a monthly basis at the Houses of Parliament in London. We even had a conference in Brussels, in Belgium a few months ago, and also at different UK universities 
And the reason we organize conferences is to influence government policy on Afghanistan by bringing together politicians, members of parliament, and think tanks, and to see what we can do as the diaspora to change the situation back home, especially after the return of the Taliban two and a half years ago. Cultural events, um, so we hold a summer festival every year in June to celebrate Refugee Week. Last year we had a two-day festival at Gunnersbury Park in Ealing. The first day was Afghanistan, the second day was Ukraine, because we were also supporting Ukrainian refugees as well. And we had over 7,000 people attending. This year, again, we're holding another summer festival in Hounslow um, for two days, but, but we decided to focus on South Asian music as well as um, Afghanistan, because West London has a very large Asian population to reflect the community. We became very busy as an organization two and a half years ago after the return of the Taliban because we became the focal point for the British Afghan population. So we were receiving hundreds of emails and inquiries every day because people needed advice about how to bring their families to the UK from Afghanistan when the evacuations started. And then as you can see, we had so much media coverage because of the queues outside our centre in Felton. And then we got lots of donations from the public, which we distributed um, to people living in the hotels. Because most of the asylum seekers are still stuck in hotels because of the housing crisis. And then we opened our second office in Birmingham. And um, now we have a third office in Liverpool as well. So I'm pleased to say that the ACAA is now the largest Afghan charity in the UK by income and we mainly rely on funding from don donations and grants from grant making trusts like the Big Lottery Fund and the Henry Smith, BBC Children in Need, some corporate donors like Heathrow Airport and the, the Department for Work and Pensions and from the Ministry of Justice. So we are still quite a small charity but our work is increasing and the impact is quite huge on the lives of the most disadvantaged people in society. Um, we've received numerous awards, like the Queen's Award for Voluntary Services. Dr. Nassimi is the first person from Afghanistan in the UK to get an MBE. So he met um, King Charles at Windsor Castle in December. And we don't just help people from Afghanistan, we have lots of beneficiaries from South America, from Eastern Europe, from the Middle East, and also from South Asia. And we work closely with job centres, with GPs and with local authorities who refer people to the charity for help. Our head office is based in, in, in Feltham, in West London, because we moved from Lewisham to Hounslow seven years ago. And outside the UK, we deliver humanitarian aid to people in Afghanistan. We focus on three main areas, improving access to healthcare, improving access to clean water, and legal advice clinics, which is about more about women's empowerment. Um, so I'll let Sharon introduce the reason why we're holding the conference today. Um, but we really look forward to working with all of you uh, in collaboration and in partnership. And, um, um, and, and thank you once again for, for coming here today. And I hope to see you all in our Felton Centre. Thank you. Uh, I will now short, briefly uh, shift to Sharon Evans. Sharon is a former television presenter. She is also a published author and has presented BBC, ITV and Sky News in a career that has spanned 30 years uh, in the newsroom. Sharon is currently the editor of Dr. Nassini's book and has worked at the ACA. So I'll pass over to you and let's try to keep it as brief as we can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Well, the good thing is, if you're a news reader, you're used to the headlines and speeding through things. Um, I'm delighted to be here. It's the first time that I've spoken um, about the project that I'm working on, which is actually writing um, Dr. Nassini's book. And I've persuaded him to, with 25 years of service, you know, why do you get an MBE? It isn't just something that happens. It's a lifetime of dedication. 
and I know that he's personally very humbled by the fact that he has um, been honoured by the King. So I thought I would just quickly spin you through um, a little bit about the actual man. And I think all of you who know anything about the Nassimis know that it isn't just Dr Nassimi, mm -hmm. it is the entire family who are passionate and who work all the time um, on this cause. And I've been in the office um, for over a year at, at one period, so I've seen how hard they all work. Now, this is the young Dr Nassimi. Um, I've also been in their photograph albums. And um, I think it's very important to see this photograph because this is where all of this has come from, from this young man's dream and from his passion. And he's extremely passionate about the cause. And this started with his father, who gave him and instilled in him the values of equality and justice for all. And he went even to war, some of you may not know that, but he fought in the war so that he could get a scholarship to get a university degree, which is what his father had dreamed for him. While he went to the Ukraine to study, he met his wife, um, and they started their family. Now, I, I bet there's a lot of young women in here who might think how hard that is to study whilst actually having children as well. And Dr. Nassimi supported um, Mrs. Nassimi through that. But when their visas actually ran out, they had to go back to Afghanistan. And when they got back to Afghanistan, Unfortunately, the Taliban um, had actually taken power. Now, unfortunately, Dr. Nassimi's liberal attitude to women and to his passion of believing that women should be educated left uh, him as a target and also Mrs. Nassimi. They were considered to be traitors when they returned to Afghanistan and they received death threats and in uh, absolute desperation, they decided that they had to sell everything and that they had to flee um, to Europe. So they made the journey with three small children across Europe, um, and it was a and I always think to myself, what is it that would make you do that? You know, to give up everything that you own, to put yourself at that kind of risk, and that is because the alternative was unimaginable. It was unimaginable for them to actually live with their children in a country where they could not have an education. Dr. Nassimi talked to me about what he was dreaming of in the UK, which was freedom of thought, freedom of movement, and a country where there was political freedom where his children could grow up. Their first attempt um, to get across the channel failed because it was in a lorry like this with a tarpaulin, and Mrs. Nassimi told me how terrifying it was because they were identified um, before they managed to get across. Now the second attempt, Dr. Nassini was told, would not fail. But they didn't know at two o'clock in the morning when they huddled in a car park waiting to be collected that the entire family were going to be put into a refrigeration lorry for an eight hour journey. And I've also spoken to Shabnam and the children about how Dr. Nassini, it was completely black, how he flicked on the light of his lighter just to give the children some hope and to make sure that they were not gonna go crazy in, in this dark, coven basically where they were. Thankfully, they talked about when the lorry landed, how they banged on the, on the door so that they could be let out. And they didn't know what to face, they were surrounded by police, police dogs, guns. Um, but thankfully, they were given safe haven. And unlike the Afghans that had come recently, they spent only a brief time in the hotel. And they were put fairly soon into a one bedroom flat where they all lived. Um, and they were in Lewisham, as Gary has said. And they both went to Lewisham College, and I've been interviewing Dr. Nassini for the book. Um, and he told me, uh, which, because I always believe that people's actions are what demonstrates what they're about. And when they landed, Dr. Nassini's passion is about integration. You can't integrate if you can't speak the language. So apparently, he went to Lewisham College in the morning, and Mrs. Nassini, who he tells me was heavily pregnant with Shakiba, went to our English lessons in the college in the afternoon while he looked after the children. And that is why this women's empowerment is all about what the Nassini family are about. He took advantage um, of the New Deal and set up a community organisation, and then that moved into um, Felton, into a charity. But during that time, the family slept on the floor in the new offices because they had to make everything work. And I think sometimes people don't see that kind of dedication. But it was worth it, because here we have um, the children, Shadlam, uh, Robia, Darius, and uh, Shakiba. We've got law degree, we've got a PhD at Cambridge, 
we have a philosophy degree, and uh, we also have Shadnam's career, um, which Dr. Nassim is very proud of. We've also built um, partnerships with MPs, with councillors, particularly with the police, and Darius has recently helped the police with healing um, after there was a serious crime involving an Afghan man who hurt a woman. Dr. Nassim is also passionate about universities and involving students in what we do, and they have um, always been a part of the work at ACAA. I know Darius touched on um, the women's empowerment, but I was personally there when the mayor awarded the lady in the middle there her certificate. She came to us not able to speak English at all. I've had women, some of these women cry when they touch a pencil because they've never been allowed to have any kind of education. And it's really humbling to see that Dr. Nassini and Mrs. Nassini wanted to give people everything that they didn't have and had to fight for. They had brought it all together. Now this is my husband. This was another, um, interesting thing in terms of breaking down barriers because Neil's an instructor in the police and Dr Nassimi said I'm not sure if he can teach with you because obviously there's concerns with the Afghan women so I said well maybe he can start in the classroom with me after a short piece of time not only was he teaching but he was also looking after the children while they did their schoolwork um, and, and that was very great success. Some of the issues that we find solutions for ACAA I was involved with this family in the Bridging Hotels, the asylum seekers and the refugees. There's no vegetables, there's no fruit. The diet is terrible and many of the children were malnourished, their hair was falling out and this, these are the little girls that this happened to. We have a fridge, a co-op fridge, and we get food at ACAA. We also help with housing. These are all just basic problems that people who come to us are in crisis all the time. And the lady in this photograph, the, the partnerships with the council and the, and the police is so important because the lady in this photograph was too scared to, uh, she was being thrown out of her home. But when we looked into it, she actually was needed to report a crime because she was the victim of violence and actually she was not, they were not entitled to evict her from her home. So she is now in her home with her disabled child and she is happy. And these are my children's toys, which are among some of the many toys that are donated to ACAA, because often the children are the forgotten victims. If you are fleeing, if you are in crisis, you are trying to just get to safety, there is no time for play and for toys. And that is something that they find at ACAA. So I hope this has given you a little insight into the actual man and the family um, and the passion behind ACAA. And I'd like to now introduce um, the very man I've been talking about, Dr. Mm -hmm. Nora Lacrosini. I don't want to speak too much because since my book will be launched in June at the Refugee Week festival. As Sharon mentioned, we are working on my book. How much I love the British people, their hospitality, the equal opportunities exist in great Britain. I express my feeling about the beautiful culture and the civilization of the British society as a whole. My colleagues told me don't talk too much and they drafted me a speech. Which normally after 25 years, this is another reason that I love Great Britain. Coming as a refugee, now I can provide lecture <laughs> at universities. Yeah. But then they told me that just read this <laughs> small speech in order to save times for other important speakers. So I can start reading my presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to the Afghanistan and Central Asian Conference, building a better future for the people of Afghanistan, more plural politics. Thank you to the London School of Economics for providing us with this room 
in central London location for this important event. I am grateful to our speakers and panel members for giving up their time for this evening. And I look forward to hearing their contributions as we consider the current challenges and the strategies necessary to create a better future for the people of Afghanistan in this face of the Taliban's barbaric dictatorship. Importantly, today the Coalition for Afghanistan's Future launched its consultation to build a new roadmap for Afghanistan. So, as you can see that we are planning to launch a coalition for Afghanistan's future, which is a huge task. Hopefully we'll have more friends to join this coalition. Our first step in the creation of a manifesto for Afghanistan's future. Our children must have a future. The prospect of the the prospect of that relies on us, Afghanistan's diaspora, and our allies in Afghanistan. We must develop a political alternative to the Taliban, a future that embraces more plural politics, develop civil society, progresses educational opportunities for all, and engage the international community, in particular the United Nations, in this course. We need to see Afghanistan free from the tyranny of the Taliban and our nation's institutions of government rebel. At this time, that means deeper consideration of how vital humanitarian aid is delivered to those poor children who need it most. It is through the innovative delivery of humanitarian support that we can start to sow the seeds of change across our country. I hope this evening we will hear ideas of how to move on from the existing <coughs> crisis. We have structured our conference to give you good time to hear from our experts and panelists. But I also want to hear from you. If we, as the diaspora from Afghanistan, come together, united behind the purpose of a transparent, pluralist manifesto for Afghanistan, the future of our country can be changed. That is why I have set up the Coalition for Afghanistan Future, a movement for Afghanistan people to champion change. And a, and a movement that governments, the international community, the United Nations must engage to promote solutions for Afghanistan society. Under the Taliban, the situation continues to deteriorate. People are starving, education is failing, and national infrastructure fails. The health system is a disaster, and immigration continues. According to the Fragile Estate Index, under the Taliban rule, the country has dropped to the sixth most fragile estate in the world. All of us here, all of us here know that human rights abuses continues in Afghanistan. The Co Coalition for Afghanistan Future will keep international attention on Afghanistan. Sadly, we live in a world that has seen a recent acceleration in human tragedy driven by dictators and extremists. Afghanistan must not be forgotten as this other events 
unfold. Thank you very much. to Daria, Sharon, and Dr. Nassili for their introductory remarks. Uh, before we head to the panel, we've just got one final keynote speech uh, by uh, Keith Best, who is a former Conservative Member of Parliament. Uh, interestingly, Keith was a British MP when Afghanistan was uh, embroiled in the Soviet-Afghan War, a conflict that began in December 1979 when the uh, Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Um, he's also the chair of uh, the Universal Peace Federation, and he has extensive experience in fostering dialogue uh, for peace and development amongst diaspora communities. Thank you, Dean. Thanks very much. <laughs> well, dear friends, it's lovely to see so many people here, and I want to pay my own <coughs> particular tribute to my dear friend, Dr. Noor Hassim Nassimi, MBE. Uh, richly deserved honour. Uh, the work that you have done in setting up the ACAA, and as Darius was saying earlier, the work that is being done now by the ACA is an inspiration, quite frankly. It is a model. I've got to go to Poland next week to give a speech at a conference about integration of, of, of refugees at an international conference. Uh, and I'm going to quote this as an example of what integration really looks like. Uh, and how it's not just the women's empowerment uh, courses, but also the ESOL uh, courses. I mean, all the things that you do, and I've been privileged to observe them, are fantastic. Uh, but first, I think we, we ought to welcome uh, that the Doha conference, which ended on Monday, uh, outlined two primary objectives. First, the establishment of an international contact group for engaging with Kabul's ruling authorities. And second, the appointment of a UN special en envoy to Afghanistan. Uh, we must now await, of course, further development. But here, in the UK, it is easy for British people who have not been invaded for a thousand years and not seen foreign occupation since that, since that time, to underestimate the sense of trauma, resentment, disappointment, longing and horror suffered by the Afghan diaspora, so well represented here this evening, at the plight of what's going on in Afghanistan. And if nothing else, I hope that this conference will be reported widely and will be an education as to the desire to see a new Afghanistan emerge from the current black days of misery and backwardness. I was speaking earlier to one of our, our friends about uh, his own family difficulties. And we all know a country that's been under occupation has that added terrible, uh, long-going legacy of collaboration with the invader, families split. It's almost like a civil war. And that, sadly, is a legacy that you're all going to have to deal with. But coupled with that present trauma is the knowledge within living memory of how Afghanistan was, not only in the freedoms of the swinging 60s and 70s, but also the 20 years prior to the disastrous withdrawal in 2021, in which educated women, half the population of Afghanistan, played a full role in society and were helping to build a civilised state that could stand alongside other cultivated nations. Now, at last, there may be some hope, as the diaspora meet here and with other Afghan communities, both in the UK and in other countries, take a positive step towards planning the future for their country. The idea of a coalition for Afghanistan's future has been some time in gestation, but it is now becoming a reality. Fundamental to the concept must be a sense of inclusion of all the disparate tribes and elements in Afghanistan so that it is truly representative. Secondly, it must be prepared to agree by consensus on what the future should be and to that end must engage with the authoritative voice with the current government in Kabul so as to influence the present leaders and show them the way to take the country forward rather than backwards. During the recent Westminster Hall debate in Parliament, 
There were cross-party calls led by Tobias Elwood MP and others for the re-establishment of a British embassy. And the minister, Andrew Mitchell, stated, and I quote, Afghanistan remains a priority for the government and is of enduring importance to UK interests in the region and far beyond. We want to see a sustainable peace and stability in Afghanistan and we remain committed to a leading role in the humanitarian response. He stated that senior officials speak regularly to the Taliban, including to secure the release of four British national detainees last October. Officials also visit Kabul when the situation permits, including a visit last December from the British Chargé d'Affaires to Kabul, where he met a wide range of senior Taliban figures. And the minister did promise to keep under review the reopening of the British Embassy. Now, such engagement cannot and must not imply support for the repressive measures of the Taliban, but must be more showing an alternative way of governing while respecting the traditions, religion and culture of Afghanistan. That engagement should be with the willing and we must understand that some of the warlords and those with more atavistic views will not wish to. But there is also now in government a younger generation which has grown up in the last 20 years and seen what can be achieved. They will be ambitious both personally and for their country, and we should use that. The genie cannot be put back in the bottle. So what needs to be achieved? Well, in the short term, the unimpeded delivery of humanitarian aid that reaches those in need and is not diverted elsewhere or is suspended for ideological reasons. There are, after all, $9 billion worth of frozen assets uh, waiting to be used. Both UNHCR and UNICEF are appealing for funds for Afghanistan. The latter estimates that there are 29.2 million people in need of humanitarian assistance, with nearly 16 million children in need requiring the US dollars of 1.4 billion. Close to 20 million people, 45% of the Afghanistan population suffer from hunger and nearly six million survive on less than one meal a day. Secondly, the rebuilding of the economy free from corruption and partisanship so that by way of example, once again, as described by Tobias Elwood, Helmand can become the breadbasket of Afghanistan and beyond, thanks to two decades of US investment just after the Second World War when the same company, incidentally, that built the Hoover Dam, created the massive irrigation systems around the Helmand River, which to this day continue to help grow, to grow the crops that feed the nation. Afghanistan, with a stable, democratically elected government, must be seen as a desirable and safe place in which companies can invest. The natural resources are there. Chromium, copper, gold, iron ore, lead and zinc, lithium, marble, precious and semi-precious stones. I've still got the lapis lazuli uh, necklace that I gave from my wife. I'm glad it was my wife. <laughs> uh, sulfur and talc, among many other minerals, all estimated back in September of 2021 as worth more than $1 trillion worth. It's a large producer of saffron and cashmere. The energy resources consist of natural gas and petroleum. There is no reason why, with correct political leadership, it should not prosper. No wonder the Chinese are so interested in gaining a foothold. Yet, Afghanistan remains among the world's least developed countries, ranking 180th in the Human Development Index. The legacy of inept, corrupt and self-interested leadership and military conflict and intervention. Yet, no foreign government has ever succeeded in permanent conquest of this land of proud and resilient people. Now, modern technology must be used to overcome geographical and infrastructure problems such as remote learning and meetings which do not require travel over long distances. Believe me, Having rattled through the whole of Afghanistan on local buses, I know what that means. 
Underpinning all this must be, as I have stated, a stable and corrupt free government and executive free from hypocrisy exemplified by current Taliban leaders in Kabul understanding the rules on schooling, sending their girls to school in Dubai. The coalition for Afghanistan's future has as part of its proposal the setting up with United Nations support and transitional assembly or government in Ba. Well, it is a beautiful city on the Silk Road, the historic mosque and fortifications, historically an ancient place of religions, Zoroastrianism and Buddhism, and one of the wealthiest and largest cities of Greater Khorasan, described by Marco Polo as a noble and great city. More importantly, for today's discussion, it is ethnically diverse, including substantial Tajik, Hazara, Pashtuns, Arab, Uzbek, Turkmen, and Sunni Hazara communities, an ideal location. Now, I mentioned the role of the coalition in engaging with the Kabul government, but it also will have another important function, which is to engage with other governments and bodies around the world, such as the European Union and United Nations, building interest and support for Afghanistan and demonstrating that there is a sensible alternative to the Taliban. Making the case of the strategic importance of Afghanistan and persuading countries that it is not a basket case, but is not only worthy, but essential to global peace for it to be saved can be one of the key aspects of the coalition. Now I end by stating a principle that should be glaringly obvious to all, but which sadly so often is overlooked or misapplied by governments and agencies seeking to become involved in the affairs of another, and from the lack of observance of which Afghanistan has suffered. It is the principle that any political solution to a nation's troubles must take into account the history and traditions as well as the culture of that country. It is no good, for example, trying to impose a form of democracy on a country which has no recognition of that in its background. A government's constitution for an integrated plural society is very different from one that is tribally, linguistically and socially diverse. At the end of the day, a new regime must be responsible and recognisable to the people and have their support. Otherwise, inevitably, it will fail. Now, some here will know I've been privileged to travel widely in Afghanistan and appreciate the beauty as well as the tragedy. Previously a somewhat settled country, the last 50 years have seen turmoil, invasion, external interference in, in conflicting ideologies and tribal warfare. We must remember that just as Kemal Ataturk was modernizing Turkey and abolishing the Fez, so King Amanullah was introducing reforms. The 1923 constitution made elementary education compulsory and abolished slavery. Yet the, ab the abolition of the traditional burqa for women and the opening of co-educational schools alienated many tribal and religious leaders and sadly led to civil war. But under King uh, Mohammed Dahir Shah, the 1930s saw the development of roads, infrastructure, the founding of a national bank and increased education. All this happened before the disastrous communist coup in 1978 and the subsequent Soviet invasion the following year, which led to a decade of occupation. After the US involvement in uh, October 2001 and the overthrow of the Taliban, we saw the attempt to build some democratic structures. Constitution of 2004 had evolved out of the Afghan Constitution Commission, mandated by the Bonn Agreement providing for an elected president of the National Assembly, with the Walesi Jirga having at least 64 of its 250 representatives being women. This may not be perfect, but it is a starting point for further improvement, trying to ensure that the different tribes and ethnicities have a say. There is also the importance of the 34 provincial councils and the village and town councils. The independence of the judiciary is crucial in ensuring compliance with the Constitution, 
and the rule of law. And maybe there needs to be a system other than appointment by the President of the members of the Supreme Court. The point of this brief history lesson, however, is to demonstrate that Afghanistan is no stranger to stable government and a democratic process. It <laughs> follows that we must build on what has gone before rather than coming forward with a completely alien new plan. As is so often the case, the secret is not in reinventing the institutions, but ensuring that they work and function well as intended. It is in that spirit of reconstruction rather than revolution, I very much hope that that will must guide Afghanistan's future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Keith, for that detailed um, background of Afghanistan and its political journey over the last few decades. Um, let's all dive into the panel discussion, which I know most of you have been waiting for. So can I invite the panelists to please come and join me at the front? Um, I think you're all seated right at the start anyway, so please come and join me, and we'll start our discussions. and not um, sort of take over my own questions right from the beginning. But I will um, set a bit of a backdrop before I, I ask uh, my moderating questions from the panel. Um, two and a half years ago, after the Taliban's resurgence, um, the situation in Afghanistan continues to remain uncertain, as, as Keith has already highlighted, with human rights conditions worsening every day at an alarming rate. The fundamental rights of women and girls uh, have been particularly targeted, facing unprecedented levels of restrictions and systemic uh, uh, violations. The crisis is compounded by a humanitarian catastrophe that sees the nation grappling with extreme poverty and a lack of basic services, making Afghanistan one of the world's most fragile states. Uh, and amid, amidst these challenges, there's a growing concern that the international community may be edging towards a tacit acceptance of the Taliban regime, prioritizing security and counterterrorism over human rights and democratic governance. However, the quest for legitimate political alternative that upholds the principles of human rights and international law remains more relevant now than ever. So tonight we aim to explore the pathways forward, focusing on societal and economic developments, women's rights, education, and the establishment of a civil society that can pave the way for a more inclusive and prosperous Afghanistan. Afghanistan has experienced, uh, I think it's the half a century of serious disruption and war. I don't think there's any country that's been going through such a journey as Afghanistan. And Amongst many other things, it has encompassed a substantial collapse of institutionalization uh, of the state. And this cannot be overemphasized. It is a collapsing state, uh, and governance is incredibly difficult for any, any, any regime uh, to sort of um, organize and build a future for the country. 
So without further ado, I will uh, introduce uh, our panelists. Often Simi, who has already provided his introductions, the founder and director of the ACAA. Uh, Keith Best, uh, the former Conservative Party Member of Parliament. Uh, Fresh Salam, uh, the country director or country coordinator for Central Asia and Amnesty International. Fresh leads efforts to uh, campaign against injustice and inequality, focusing on human rights in the, in the region. David Osborne is project director for Afghan Witness. David utilizes strategic communication and open source intelligence. Uh, to monitor human rights and security in Afghanistan. Um, Dr. Afzal Ashraf, uh, who is a senior officer in the British Armed Forces with operational experience in Afghanistan and other conflicts. He has served in the UK Foreign Office and is a former research uh, fellow at St. Andrews uh, University and is also a, a consultant fellow at the Royal U United Services Institute Think Tank. So we do have a breadth of experience here and expertise and a variety of uh, knowledge that I'm sure we'll be able to uh, get a lot uh, out of. So I'll, I'll direct my first question, if that's all right, to you, Fresha. You are an Amnesty Country Coordinator for Central Asia. From your experience in the region, uh, what immediate international actions do you recommend towards supporting and empowering uh, Afghan women and girls? Um, First of all, thank you so much for having me here. I think as international, as Amnesty International, and me representing Amnesty International, I think we do um, expect, uh, we already had like 32,000 people signing for a petition, which emphasized on the UK government to make sure that we have the support of the UK government to kind of like bring the human right awareness within Afghanistan, but also like defending the human right defenders. We feel like sometimes that in Afghanistan, when you're as a human rights defender, your life is in risk, is in danger, and we would like to protect those human rights defenders as well. And also, like I think one of the major and I would say important thing that has affected the uh, situation in Afghanistan, of course, is the women's. And we would like to have um, we, will, we would like to have the UK government to, you know, like work closely with the human rights uh, organization within Afghanistan. We know that some of them is already closed. This is something where we're working towards it to make sure that the, the subject of women should be not forgotten because this is, I think, one of the mo much most important things. But also, I think we feel like the human humanitarian aid, since the arrival of Taliban, the humanitarian aid has declined. That is because since the Taliban's they don't allow women um, to have freedom of speech. They are not allowed to go to school, girls. And I think that's one of the reasons that I feel like international communities, they, don't, they are not keen to support the donors. And I feel like, for example, in 2023, United Nations wanted to have 3.2 billion aid for Afghanistan. However, only one third was funded. So this is not enough, and I feel like we need to, we need to, the question is like, okay, we've got one side of the United Nations, which is the humanitarian side, and on the other side, we've got the political side, okay? So I feel like it's also important, at the moment, right now, I think the humanitarian side is very important, because we cannot, we, we need to, we need to have the, um, we need to have a balance between the, humanitarian side and the political side, I totally understand that having the humanitarian aid on the long term might not be the solution for Afghanistan, because Afghanistan needs to become independently, economically, um, however we need to have a, a bit of a balance. Thank you so much, uh, Fresha. Um, David, um, let's bring you in. Um, reflecting on your work uh, with Afghan business, um, in human rights monitoring, what are the primary obstacles to media freedom uh, and the free flow of information in Afghanistan? And how do, the, uh, do these challenges impact the reporting and documentation of human rights abuses in, in Afghanistan? Sure, I'll, try, I'll speak without a microphone because I don't know that side. But um, yeah, I, I don't think it will come as a surprise to anybody that you know, as soon as the Taliban takeover happened, you had widespread flights of 
you know, traditional sources of, of information, whether that was media, which had developed over the 20 years, um, you know, flight out to the country on a large scale, same with a lot of NGOs, um, and, they did, and they moved immediately into exile. Some people have remained um, and continued to report, but they've faced constant sustained pressure. I think you know, rarely a week goes by without reports of uh, a media uh, you know, a media platform being raided, uh, journalists being arrested, journalists disappearing. Um, and that happens, like I say, on effectively a, a weekly basis. Uh, and that's not to mention media outlets that are closed down because of economic reasons, which again is, is you know, hundreds uh, that have just folded because they, they can no longer um, survive. So the sources of information from the ground, um, reliable sources uh, of information from the ground have, have diminished greatly. Um, and, and what has happened is, you know, whether it is uh, the old established media houses of Afghanistan that are now trying to operate in exile, or whether it is new startups, and there are some very good new uh, you know, Afghan-run media startups now operating in exile, um, they are reliant on you know, occasional sources on the ground, information coming out from social media, um, and that's extremely difficult to verify. Um, and and so journalists now, instead of having uh, being able to go and report physically on things, are having to rely on their ability to verify open source information, things that they might see on social media, um, or risk reporting things on social media that might not be true. And that in itself has created um, you know, a compound problem where there is a huge amount of information, you know, you search every day on Afghanistan or the Taliban or whatever, there is a huge amount floating around. It's extremely difficult to know uh, you know what is, you know what is true, what is verified. Uh, you know, is it new? Is it old? Um, whether that's got supported by video um, or not, and that actually feeds a whole environment of you know, a loss of trust, um, a loss of uh, confidence in, in in media, and that is a very dangerous downward spiral because, I mean, I think trust in information, and whether it's in Afghanistan or in the United States or the UK or anywhere, trust in media, trust in information is the fundamental building block of a people's understanding of society and more, you know, people's ability to make decisions about society. Um, and so when that is lost, um, we're in trouble. And I think you know, within Afghanistan now you have you know, lots of good media you know, trying to do their best to report. Um, you've got those outside the country trying to do the best to report, and it's a constant battle with the Taliban's own you know, propaganda ecosystem, whether that's RTA or all the other bodies as well. And I think you know, what is important is with all of this you know, campaigning media, factual media, and, and sort of Taliban propaganda, that there is that, that, that doesn't come at the expense uh, and, and ultimate sort of trust and information. So I think that is, that is a, a big challenge um, for the whole question of sort of the future of the, of the country. Thank you, uh, David. Um, just before I, I move on to you, Dr. Uh, Ashraf, I just want to let you know that this is our first panel, which is uh, focusing on the current barriers to development and growth in Afghanistan. The second part of the discussion will be around concrete pillars and actionable steps that need to be taken. Um, Dr. Ashraf, you have previously mentioned that over the last 20 years, the West has constantly indicated a complete complete lack of cultural and strategic intelligence on Afghanistan. Could you elaborate a little bit more on how this perception has influenced Afghanistan's trajectory post-NATO withdrawal and how the role of neighboring countries might play in uh, fostering stability in the region? Well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me um, uh, offer uh, the apologies of my dear friend and colleague, Professor Caroline Kennedy Pipe who wrote the intelligent bits of my, our, our paper, and uh, I now have to defend them. Um, secondly, um, uh, uh, contrary to your um, introduction, uh, I am no longer, and haven't been for a long time, a senior officer in the um, um, British military. Um, that has long gone, uh, and uh, yes, I was in the Foreign Office, but I'm now masquerading uh, as an academic from Loughborough University. So anything I say doesn't reflect on the British government or the military, but if you want to ask me questions, I will spill the beans. Um, in answer to your question about a lack of uh, knowledge and, and, and strategy, um, well, uh, I can speak very, um, I think reasonably well on how 
that cause the problems that we're facing. Um, there is virtually no understanding of um, uh, uh, Pashtun or Afghan culture. There was no understanding of the, the strengths there. Um, and there was uh, uh, no real strategic thought. Um, why is there a lack of strategic thought? Well, it's not because there is a lack of strategic thinkers. The United States of America has some of the most brilliant minds anywhere in the world. The problem is that the United States of America, um, in my opinion, and it's a personal opinion, ladies and gentlemen, um, ha is, is run by small cabals of ideological thinkers. So strategy uh, is filtered through what they want to do, the small uh, groups that surround the government, uh, and so we end up with um, ill-thought-out material, um, and the, 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 um, the consequences are clear. Incidentally, um, uh, I, I wish I had known this was a question, I would have brought you a photograph uh, taken of uh, myself and one of my uh, colleagues, a, a, um, a, a a sergeant major in the parachute regiment uh, who is training the Afghan army. And in that uh, photograph, um, he or his friends have put a little thought bubble. We said in soldierly language uh, words to the effect that uh, when we leave here, this place is all going to fall apart. Um, this is in, uh, in 2011. Um, we knew, I certainly knew, that. Um, it will end the way it did. And the only thing that was a surprise that it took so long to get there. Um, so the, the, the lack of strategic thought was, uh, it's a bit like the empire, uh, you know, emperor's new clothes. Um, it's because of the political structure that exists in great powers, it isn't as rational as it could be. Um, and so in your, your question to me and to others, is one of the barriers. And the barriers are, are several, but they all um, are to do with the way we think. Um, we make, I think most of us, a reasonable assumption that when our governments say they're going to do something, particularly if it's to, um, to, to, to um, free people, to give them rights, to rescue them from um, totalitarian regimes who are abusing them, we buy into that. It's reasonable. The fact is that um, political culture is such that there is a justification narrative, it's a liberal justification narrative, particularly in democratic societies, for what are realist objectives. And those realist objectives are not visible um, uh, for, unless you are nowhere to look for them. And behavior is one of the ways that you can tell what the, um, the objective is. When we're dealing with things that are passionately held, and particularly, uh, I, I salute my uh, Afghan friends in, in this audience. Um, naturally, you feel strongly about this. I, naturally, uh, every one of us, and particularly the women in this audience, feels passionately about female empowerment. It is difficult, then, to take a rational view. And in that paper that you alluded to, one of the things that Caroline and I tried to show was in the West, female emancipation, which is brilliant. I know it's not perfect even in, in Europe at the moment, but it's taken over a century, and it wasn't a, a direct trajectory. Women were pushed into the forefront when they were needed, and then were pushed backwards when they weren't needed. To try to replicate that in a different society in a compressed time frame is very difficult, and we need to be realistic uh, about what to achieve. Um, the other ba barrier, is this idea uh, that um, what we assume to be the solution may not be the solution. Um, and sometimes uh, challenging ourselves or having others challenge us, especially outsiders, can be very painful because what would be a, 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 an attack on a way of thinking becomes a personal attack. And the final barrier, and I know you want me to move on very quickly, the final barrier is uh, the, um, the, I think, uh, uh, Presh, you, you alluded to it a little bit, and that is 
the differences, the complex nature of international organizations, the humanitarian elements of our international organizations, the legal elements of the international organization, and the political elements. And this ties into the point I was making between the difference between the political narrative, the liberal narrative of change, of in <coughs> intervention, and the realist narrative. And I think we need to think about those when we think about the pillars. Thank you. Um, Keith, you've got a lot of experience with diaspora communities. Um, what strategies can be employed to leverage uh, Afghanistan's diaspora's potential uh, in the UK and uh, around Europe and the US in, to contribute towards economic and political development back <coughs> in Afghanistan? Well, in any political system, influence is uh, everything. I mean, you started very well. He's had a chat with the king. I mean, you can't get better than that. Uh, but uh, to be to be re really serious about it, I mean, you have got to get involved at every level of government in this country and actually persuade people. Uh, and, you know, we need to have audiences like this, not just of people from the diaspora, but other people as well. So the message has got to be spread widely. And so every opportunity that you can, you've got to bring home to people what it is like. And, and you, you summed it up uh, so, 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 so very, very well, um, uh, and it was summed up actually uh, earlier, um, about <coughs> you know, what does it take to pack a small bag with a few of your belongings knowing that you've got to leave many of them behind, leaving your familiar culture, your language, your surroundings, your friends and everything like that. What does it take for people to have to do that? And that's how I usually start when I'm talking to a British audience, because actually most British people have no concept of that. They've never had to do it. And so I think it is bringing home the personal experience of the diaspora. I mentioned in my remarks uh, some of the, the legacy issues of what happens when countries invade. I mean, we've seen you know, both the Russia and the West in Afghanistan, and I'm not going to go back further into, into history. But uh, you know, that leaves a terrible legacy of divided families where some have moved one way and others have moved another, let alone the tribal divisions to which I, I, I refer to. So, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> some people would say you can't create a country called Afghanistan out of what, what, what is there. Well, I think we've proved, history has proved that that's not the case, but it requires very, very careful management and very careful understanding and dialogue. So I think the, 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 my message to everybody is to uh, you know go along and talk to the women's institute, go along and talk to the to the to the local church, you know, go along and talk to the local mosque, go, go along and talk to people about that and get them engaged and make them feel angry, make them feel angry that there are fellow human beings having to go through this sort of thing. So actually, they want to take action. Very well put. Thank you, Keith. Um, Dr. Nsini, you um, you run an organization and Afghanistan's civil society continues to challenge uh, the Taliban's pursuit of a uh, um, dignified, free and democratic Afghanistan. Um, what can be done uh, to engage Western politicians and policymakers? And how can we ensure that the international community support is optimized to strengthen, strengthen civil society both in Afghanistan and abroad uh, and ensure that we can inform future international policy uh, that is shaped around uh, the country. <clears throat> Again, uh, thanks to the British involvement in Afghanistan since 2001, uh, we have developed a very strong civil society in Afghanistan. I think it was the most the strongest civil society in all uh, the Central and South Asia maybe for the past 20 years. But now, when you look at the situation, for example, the meeting in Doha, so the Taliban uh, rejected, refused the participation of the civil society 
in Doha Summit. Yeah? So how we can uh, improve the situation without the participation of the civil society? So my answer is very short. Uh, is that we need to focus on um, allowing and giving the chance to the civil society to have their voice, to have their recommendation, as well as uh, to participate in all uh, peace talk uh, in the future. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mazzini. I, I, I definitely agree that today's scenario is far from encouraging uh, and wouldn't confront any individual attempting to manage any sort of political transition uh, with deep and profound challenges. Um, and I'm sure it's something that uh, political science has uh, no easy solution uh, yet either. Um, before we jump to the second panel, we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, please um, raise your hand if you have anything to ask of our panel. Um, anything relating to what they've said or any other questions that you might have, uh, particularly focusing around the current barriers um, that Afghanistan faces around economic and societal growth and development. Yes. Uh, I'm interested. Uh, please introduce yourself before um, you ask Alan questions. Alan Kelly. I have been working and living in Afghanistan for the last 20 years. So I find it interesting with some of the perspectives that have been given this evening, because we've reached a point where I think, as Dr. Ashcroft mentioned, we're on a realist narrative. The Taliban are not going to be overthrown. They've come to power, they've got more conservative. We know the edicts that are coming out monthly, which are making more restrictions. Women, 50% of the population, have lost basic human rights. But how do we operate in wanting to stay engaged as a development, an international development community in that situation? And I think it requires this very careful balance. As you mentioned, there is going to be some trade-offs. At the moment, no one accepts the de facto authority. But we want to do something about the humanitarian crisis with over 20 million people. There's a shortage of humanitarian money. The economy is contracted, but we need to move beyond that humanitarian box and start working in the development box, which means how do we engage? Suddenly, everyone is putting money in the UN agencies. They've got an absorption capacity issue and a high cost in delivery. They do a good job in certain areas. In others, they're equivalent to a consulting. So we need to look at how strategically we can move forward. And this comes back to a couple of points that your panel have raised. How do we get better engagement with civil society? Civil society is functioning. There are restrictions, but they're still operating in that restricted space. And we need to be looking, which is my question, how we improve that engagement with local civil society and how we engage local private sector. We've got to get the economy growing. The country is going to be an aid-dependent country until the natural resource base and the minerals are developed, and we're looking at a very long-term horizon to achieve that point. Thank you. Is that question directed at anyone in particular? Broad. Anyone. Okay. Who's to pick that one up? Well, shall, shall I just come in very briefly? Um, I, I, I mentioned that you, you referred to you know, half the population of Afghanistan is in danger of severe hunger. Uh, that's a terrible situation. I mean, many of those are, are, are children. Uh, I, I don't have a problem about freeing up frozen assets and actually sending humanitarian aid in. I know there is a reluctance of donor governments uh, for fear that, you know, this is going to be sent out into a population where they don't have access to disinterested media, where they don't know anything about where this has come from, uh, and it will enhance the, the Taliban uh, in, in people's view because this aid is, is coming through. I mean, I remember, I won't digress, but I remember the, the story of the Americans pouring in masses of aid into Vietnam, and it was being distributed out, grain, sacks of grain out to the villages. 
and it went through what uh, was the Vietnamese customs uh, and the customs were writing in Vietnamese uh, on the sacks as they went out. What the Americans didn't realise is that the Viet Cong had infiltrated the customs and what they were writing on the sacks was a present from the Viet Cong as it went out to the villages. So, I mean, there is a, there is a danger that, you know, aid can be likened to what the government is, is doing. But I don't think that is the important thing. The important thing is to stop people starving and to actually help them. So I, I, I don't have a problem with engaging with the Taliban government in order to get the humanitarian aid in there. I, I think you're absolutely right about civil society, and Dr. Nassimi uh, uh, mentioned it. It's not perfect, um, and you know we've seen in Russia how you know every foreign agency is now regarded as alien and, uh, and, and told that it can't operate there and everything. So I mean, a, a government like the Taliban, which has total control, although I think that again is disputable because it depends on where you are in Afghanistan as to which group of Taliban doing doing what. But uh, nevertheless. Uh, you know, there is, there is a danger that civil society can be isolated. But it, we have to deal with where we are, not where we want to be. And we have to deal with that civil society, as you were rightly saying. Thank you. Is there any other contributions, David? Yeah, I, I just say, I mean, it's the same, it's, it's the question that all, all governments are grappling with at the moment. Um, and, and, you know, the areas, despite all the Taliban's Come down on civil society, particularly international uh, organisations in areas like education, areas which they find problematic. You know, they, they have tried to push CSAs out of areas which they see as uh, potential vectors of influence, but there are still you know, programmes surviving in terms of economic, uh, basic economics, basic social support, basic healthcare provision, uh, even if it is uh, you know, as limited as radio shows on how to craft a woman has just given birth. So it is, you know, it is the, the bare bones, but it is that question of you know, do you do nothing um, or do you, do you do something? And I think part of it, you know, I think it's always difficult to, to say, think about it from the Taliban's point of view, um, but you know, the whole concept, the whole language of civil society organisations is pretty confrontational as far as they're concerned. You know, they, they, they were the enemy for years when the Taliban were in insurgency, and so now it's very difficult, now they're in power, to say you should have a relationship with civil society because they see it as this is a Western funded thing that's been set up over 20 years. So, in some ways, I think it wouldn't be a bad thing to you know, completely reset that language, avoid that, and actually focus on that community level support and avoid, again, avoid the language of CSOs, but community support. Family support, all of that is very much within Afghan Islamic culture. It is fundamental to it. And talking about that, showing where it works, showing where it solves problems for the Taliban, and, and you know, showing, showing how it can help, and avoiding saying this is a success of civil society, you know, is a slow way to sort of build a bit of room for what we would call civil society to, to operate and be successful. Thank you. I'd like to build on uh, the excellent points that we made, uh, David in particular. And first of all, thank you for articulating a very important point very clearly. Um, there's a lot of truths being spoken, but they're incomplete truths. Um, we have to be humble and ask ourselves why and how did the Taliban regain power uh, when we had the most awesome military force on the ground. There was some stuff that made the Taliban appealing. You don't have to like the Taliban, I certainly don't. You, you, you can still be committed to changing them, but if you are not honest with yourself, or if we aren't honest with ourselves, then we will not find a solution. And I think to some degree that is what David was looking at, trying to understand who they are and what, what their appeal might be and undercut it. Um, another uh, truth uh, that um, Dr. Nassimi mentioned is the, the, the brilliant society we live in. My father came here in 1955. I can endorse that. This is a great country. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. But this is a country that also is allied to the United States of America, and the United States of America has, taken, uh, has had policies where the lives of children are calculated to be sacrificed when, in the 1990s, 
um, Madeleine Albright was asked whether half a million children's deaths through sanctions was worth it. She says it's a difficult issue, but we feel it was a, wor a price worth paying. So this is the most honest articulation of the realist narrative there is. And the world knows this. The people in other parts of the world see the United Kingdom differently from those of us who live here. So honesty is very important. One fantastic uh, solution, again, is illustrated by Dr. Messini's life in terms of civil society. He went, left the country, and he discovered a new way of looking at the world. He bought that back, and unfortunately, he wasn't allowed to do very much. There is an opportunity now by engaging with the Taliban and allowing a civil society to be created. If we offer scholarships, if LSE offers scholarships for young men, because it's not going to be women initially, we might get one, maybe two, maybe more Dr. Nassimis who can go back and make the change that's necessary. Thank you. Um, is there any other questions before we move on? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Hi, so um, my name is Nabila, and um, I'm from, also from Amnesty International. Um, I just want to, there's a room full of people here, so I just want to ask Freshta, uh, what can we as activists do to actually help the women of Afghanistan? What kind of actions can we take? Um, because I'm sure like, after hearing all of this, I, I would like to take some action and, and actually do something practical. Thank you. Thank you. I, think, I think it's increasing the human rights awareness in Afghanistan, of course, like uh, covering all the aspects and I think also like really focusing on all the bad things the Taliban do actually. Um, I think that's very important because I think we need to bring the message to the world that this is not enough for us just for, I mean like millions of Afghans, they are under the rule of Taliban. This is not fair. This is literally not fair for those Afghan people and they have right to for education, they have right to, to freedom, to speech and, and I feel like this is, they either have to change themselves, Taliban, or which is most likely not, because we have to understand that the, the, the ideology of Taliban is against women. So this is what makes Taliban. So if they're gonna say like, okay, you know what, we're gonna allow all the women to go to school, then Taliban doesn't exist. Because the main key message for the world is like, in the, in the name of, they wanna, focus more on their values, their Islamic values. But we have to understand that Afghanistan has always been an Islamic country. And every Afghan who lives in Afghanistan, they are Muslim. So we are born Muslim, so we don't need a group of Taliban to come and teach us what Islam is. We've always lived under the value of Islam. So if the Taliban say like, oh, we would like, we are happy because we have had some speeches from the head of the Taliban saying like, oh, we are okay to allow women to go to school and girls to go to school and women are allowed to work. However, it has to be according to the Islamic values, which is Islamic values. We always had Islamic values. So, and we have to learn from the past that this is the second time the Taliban are in power. And I feel like the past should be a lesson for us. And I don't, I don't, I personally don't think Taliban will change unless if they want to share, they want to, they want to, you know, rule the country with another parties. And I think it's it's very important for a country to have different voices from different community from the different group. I think this is what makes e equality and social justice. And I think this is the message that we need to make sure that the Taliban understands and gets the message. And this is what we can do as an activist. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I know there's already some more hands up uh, for questions, but we'll, we'll, we'll jump onto the second panel and then we'll take your questions uh, for that because otherwise we won't have enough time uh, to fit both in. So the, sec the second panel is uh, focusing on pillars to create a roadmap for building a better future for the people of Afghanistan. I won't ask specific questions of each panelist because I'm sure there's a lot more interesting um, insights that, that can come from the audience. Um, but the message here is clear. Afghanistan is embarking on one of the most challenging periods in its history. And there needs to be a very high level of commitment from the wider world uh, to sustain Afghanistan, but also protect its people through this very difficult period. I'll just throw out a question, please, um, you know, 
very briefly answer what this commitment uh, from the international community looks like and what are the pillars uh, that are needed to create any sort of roadmap because there are already a lot of conversations by a number of different groups both in the UK and internationally of building an alternative for Afghanistan or finding a solution that, uh, that reflects the needs of the entire population. What does this commitment and support from the international community look like and what do we need to be doing moving forward? So I'll throw it out there, please. Um, I'll start with um, David. Okay, thanks, Um yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very tough question. I mean, I think, uh, you know, when, uh, when the Taliban takeover happened, I think everybody was in crisis mode. Um, and, you know, some people may think that we've moved on from that, um, but we really haven't. And there are still, you know, thousands of immensely qualified, uh, talented uh, people who have senior positions, people in business, all of that sitting in hotel rooms in the UK and, and elsewhere. And you know, supporting the community in exile in the diaspora in that crisis mode is still needed. That hasn't gone away. And you know, whether it's UK government or you know, other governments are doing a lot. The Canadians have done a lot. Brazil now takes an awful lot of Afghan refugees. There are people doing that. But that that phase is still not over. And that crisis response, whether it's for you know normal Afghans or human rights defenders, uh, media, etc. that still needs to go on. And there are a lot of people doing work on that, but, but you know, that needs to be sustained. It's not a short-term thing. Um, and then I think it's, it's really about protecting and, and supporting the, the fundamentals, if you like, of a, of a plural democratic system um, in exile. And, and that is doing the politics. Uh, events like this, um, coalitions, great, you mentioned, you know, there's more than one. Um, well, let's have them talking to each other. Like, you know, there, there was a lot of difficult <coughs> conversations to have. Um, you know, there's a lot of disagreements uh, across this sort of Afghan political space. Uh, and it's probably better to figure out those things now, uh, rather than when, uh, when, when, when you get back in country. So I, th I think that's, uh, that's a big one, and, and not shying away from the challenges um, that there are and the difficulties, and, and the tough questions like, you know, how much do we engage with the Taliban? Is there any chance at all of, you know, taking them uh, along the path with us, or, uh, and even if we can't, like, you know, appreciating that they are in control of the country? Um, so, yeah, I don't have too many solutions, but some ideas. Thank you. Um, yes, that's a Let me just uh, give three pillars. First one is um, the approach. And here it's very important not to um, uh, confuse uh, the means and ends. Uh, if our ends are a freer, more prosperous, uh, more, uh, more equal, equal society in Afghanistan, let's not begin with the means, which is the removal of the Taliban. And that's very easy to do because we can't envisage it, it without that. But it's important that we start with what we want, to, to be very clear about what we want to achieve. And that can be achieved uh, through the sort of greater engagement uh, that has been uh, looked at. It's how we um, implement that. So um, my suggestion is that uh, the, 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 the avenues that are being opened up are opened up with the Taliban in, an, in a spirit of mutual respect. Um, we don't have to like them, we don't have to agree with them, but we must make them feel that they are being recognized as the government in uh, Kabul. Uh, they, are, they must feel that uh, they are being offered assistance, genuine assistance, because once they do, then their guards uh, are down. Then they will be open to, uh, uh, to interacting. Um, the important thing there, the second pillar, is how do you weaken or transform initially the Taliban and then hopefully replace them with something much better. Um, and to that end, my uh, studies in international relations and, and government uh, tell me that uh, the more you um, uh, deal with the totalitarian regime from the point of view of external influence or intervention, the more, uh, the longer it will survive. Um, you can see lots of examples, the Rhodesian example, you can see the Korean example and so on. They rely on resistance. They rely on somebody attacking them. <coughs> 
And the more, the less that resistance is, the greater the cooperation, the, child, the greater the chances. The one thing that differentiates the Taliban from the examples I've given is that it's not a centralized regime. There's a great deal of diversity. And the other thing is that it's uh, at the heart, at the moment, it's the extremists that are in power. And the thing about extremists is that they turn in on themselves because for them, um, there is a competition of, within them as to who can be more extreme and therefore more authentic. And that's why they suffer from a huge amount of infighting. And that's something that will weaken them. Um, let me um, move on to the, the female issue. And I think this, um, the issue of uh, female emancipation, I think we've uh, recognized must be organic. And I think, again, for us to make a very good point about it must be Islamic. Well, we have one of the best models in the world of female emancipation in one of the most conservative uh, aspect of religions of Islam or sects of Islam, and that is the um, that is the Salafi religion, which predominates in South uh, in Saudi Arabia, but is also the only the only other country which practices is Qatar. Qatar, ladies and gentlemen, has the highest proportion of STEM qualified women in the world, and I've been there. They're not just qualified; they're actually leading. I've been to conferences where the primary speakers on cybersecurity are women. I've been to, uh, to, to organizations such as banks where the women are running the show and their deputies are Qatari men. So it's, it's something that's in practice. The, uh, the current um, uh, deputy foreign minister is one of my students. Uh, I taught her diplomacy, or I had part of her uh, diplomacy. The point is, here we have a model that I know, and one of the reasons why the Taliban spokesmen were saying, yes, we've got we've no problem with female empowerment, is because they came from Qatar. And it's the conservative guys who haven't left the country that uh, stopped them from going the way they wanted to go. And so we should encourage um, the, a bilateral agreement, or we should encourage Qatari leadership with this in mind, and this is something this organization can help to develop, to get the Taliban to see how, even if you want to have a conservative form of Islam, women can and do contribute. So that's one example. The final point really is that warning that I mentioned at the outset. And that warning is, remember that there are people out there that only see this, not through the prism of the um, the Afghan people, if they cared about the Afghan people, then they would have delivered on the most fundamental rights of women, which is the right to life. They killed thousands of women um, in, during, when they were occupying uh, Afghanistan. Um, and that, they, all they care about is that the Taliban are seen to be punished for uh, highlighting a failure in Western um, uh, designs, political designs. And so those of us who want genuinely for Afghanistan to progress must uh, be aware that there will be spoilers in the system and we must navigate around them. To just finish this point, I, let me just say that in my humble opinion, the war that's going on in Gaza is the first war, war in, in modern history that is a war between power and principle. And those international institutions are fighting a war on principle. Uh, those people who are throwing bombs and bullets are, are working on the assumption that power do, predominates. And if we as a society don't um, ensure that principle triumphs, then we will be set back. So this uh, Afghan issue must not be seen in isolation of the geopolitics. And this war that is currently going on, it needs to be won on principle, not on power. If we do that, it will weaken the spoilers greatly. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, the two pillars, strategic importance and engagement. And underpinning all that is self-interest. Uh, we, uh, we have one international organization, which at the moment is emasculated, by the use or threatened use of the veto uh, in the Permanent Five of the Security Council. And what is interesting is to see 
how the General Assembly is now uh, flexing its muscles far more and demanding of the Security Council more sensible uh, resolutions. But don't pin your hopes on the United Nations, I'm afraid, because of what's going on in, in, the, in, the, in the P5. Um, every Secretary of State for the United States, every foreign minister in the UK, in the United Kingdom, every foreign minister in Moscow is self-interested. They're not there as global politicians, they're there for their own country's interests. And we have to recognize that. And the important thing to get across is actually, if you create a vacuum in Afghanistan, in that strategic geopolitical position in which it is now, We've seen history tell us what happens when you allow a vacuum to create and all sorts of nasty, crawly things go, go into it and actually we end up with being on the brink of, of, of world, world conflagration. So we have got to get the message across to uh, an increasingly isolationist United States, and I'm not even talking about what might happen in the November uh, elections, but I think under any administration you're seeing uh, they're almost a retreat back into the 1920s and 30s of America stepping out of its involvement. I mean, we've had these siren messages about how Europe's got to look after itself and can't rely on the United States. Um, we've, we've got uh, in, in Moscow a regime that is determined to recreate historically the old mother Russia, uh, whatever that takes by way of occupation of neighboring lands that have since been internationally recognized as having their own territorial integrity. So we've got to, first of all, get the message across that Afghanistan is strategically important. And if you are in the West, the one siren thing that you should understand about Afghanistan is why are the Chinese there? Why are the Chinese getting more and more involved? And if you're in the West, if you're in that, that frame of mind, you are terrified about the Chinese getting involved. So that should be a stimulus, if, if nothing else. But, but secondly, it does mean engagement. And I mentioned about the reopening of the British Embassy. We need to have countries understanding not only the strategic importance of Afghanistan, but also the fact that the only way you try to influence things diplomatically, not by force of arms, is by engagement with whoever is there at the moment. I am a child of the Cold War. I lived for most of my life under this wonderful doctrine of mutually assured destruction. Its acronym was so appropriate, MAD. And we lived in the knowledge that neither the Soviets, as they then were, nor the West would launch an initial nuclear strike because it would mean inevitable annihilation of the whole, the whole world. It was a very, very uneasy piece, I can tell you. But I have to say, I think now, I'm living in an even more uneasy time. Uh, and we have to therefore have those two pillars, the strategic importance of Afghanistan and getting countries to actually re-engage with Afghanistan. Even if, you know, in the United States, they've washed their hands of it at the moment, but saying, look, you can't allow this to happen because you're going to end up with another quasi-Vietnam war on your hands. Thank you. Uh, Keith? And please do, uh, Prashna and Dr. Seen, if you keep your final points uh, short, I do really want to come back to the audience. So what are the pillars, what are the steps that need to be taken towards uh, development? Yes. Um, sorry, I just wanted to add something on Dr. Avanas that he said about we can't use power. I definitely agree. I'm going to keep it very short because I feel like the Afghan people, they don't have the energy anymore for more war. So we need to find a solution. So right now, I feel like Afghanistan is in a very tricky situation. So from one side, I feel like the international community, none of them, they have recognized the Taliban officially. So that is one problem. So one of the reasons that the Taliban did not attend the Doha conference is because they don't want to represent Afghanistan as a Taliban, but they want to represent as a government of Afghanistan. But however, nobody has recognized them. So I think this is something that international community, they need to come up with a solution and officially announce whether they have recognized the Taliban or not. Mm -hmm. So in that way, we can, go, we can move forward. And then on the other hand, that Taliban, they need to sit down together and come up with a strategy and show the world that Afghanistan is in a safe hand. For example, the fact that the Taliban did not attend 
the, um, the conference in Doha last week, that was an opportunity for the Taliban to come and build a relationship with the international community, but they failed to do so. So what happens now? The Afghan people suffer. So now the question is, where are we standing? So we need the international community to come half away, and we want the Taliban to come half away, so we can, we, we can figure out somehow something. But right now, Afghanistan is a very, very tricky situation. There is no cooperation from the international community because they don't, they don't recognize, and Taliban, they don't want to do anything with the international community because they, they are not recognized. And then I think that's, that's I think the key thing, that we need to build the bridges, not break the bridges. Uh, to be honest, <clears throat> I touched on this in my previous conversation, maybe informally in, uh, in some other events. One of the reasons that the people of Afghanistan, they are suffering, is because they can't speak English language. If 40 million people, they cannot speak English, how they can share their concerns to the wider community? And that's why I hope that the coalition for Afghanistan future, if they succeed to uh, set up an next transition in Afghanistan, we want to make the English language an official language in Afghanistan. This is number one. Whether you start laughing or maybe becoming astonished, this is another secret. The second thing is to prevent Chinese and Russia from uh, intervention or stealing the resources, Maybe Afghanistan should become a member of the Commonwealth. Why not? There are some countries that I can't remember in my mind. I can't. It's not in my mind. I can't remember that. Mozambique. Yeah, huh? Mozambique. has been under British occupation. <laughs> and I think that this is the first maybe uh, uh, proposal made on Afghanistan to become the member of the Commonwealth, maybe it is, this is Dr. Nassimi. <laughs> so this is my, my, my points on, this, on the future of Afghanistan. Thank you. I'll take uh, a few questions all at once, and then we'll come to the earth, and I'll be the final uh, contributions from the audience. Um, yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, Me? Yes. Um, so I just had a question. I, I don't know who should answer the question, but since Felicita is the country director for Central Asia, and building on what Keith was saying about the increase in Chinese influence, um, I was just, or maybe Dr. Nassim even as well can answer the question. I was just interested to know your opinion about the implications of the Taliban's return on Central Asia, in particular on like Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, uh, sorry, Tajikistan, because as you know, we have a substantial Tajik and Uzbek population in the north of Afghanistan which shares a border with Central Asia. So, and, and, and what do you think about the, um, the situation in terms of like religious extremism in Central Asia? And how do you think Central Asia can also protect itself against the threats p posed by regional terrorism? Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Um, yes, go ahead yourself. Thank you. Um, Jeremy Davies from Albany Associates. I was wondering, it's sort of been touched on here and there, what role, if any, strategic communications could play throughout um, the, the new coalition and as it raising Afghanistan's. Um, you know, there's been talks about there's a realist versus liberal narrative, that there's a need to get information into Afghanistan so people know where the state is coming from. They're not necessarily abandoned. <coughs> So I was just wondering what role, if any, people can perceive, perceive that um, taking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there, and then I think there was one from the back as well. Mike, um, yeah, so yourself or someone else. Yeah, yeah basically I wanted to ask about why the British Embassy should be reopened in Afghanistan. Although I don't agree with the Taliban, I don't agree that the British Embassy should reopen there, whereas the only the solution I was suggesting was that to empower the communities and find leadership within the civil communities, and also uh, we have to, like you said, be honest about um, 
you know, China's involvement, but we have to also be honest about the UK's involvement and the US involvement. And just to clarify, it's not a war in um, Palestine, it's an occupation, there's a whole history, you can check out, it's all over the internet, you can check it out. And I think the plight of Palestine is similar to the plight of Afghanistan. Also, I um, really like the fact that, sorry, what's your name, David Osman was saying about um, the media, which is great because we can also train up the local civil people, the people that are of Afghanistan, train them as journalists so we get the real news rather than the scripted news we get from BBC, Sky News, etc, etc. So that way we get a real authentic experience of the people, their point of view, what they want and what they do not want, and how we can find better solutions to empower the people, men, women. Because although I don't, I don't agree with Taliban, and according to Islamic um, rules, women are, have the right to their education. I mean, a Muslim woman Thank you. the first university. Yeah. So there's some there's great solutions, but you have to listen to the people. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, um, unless there's any other pressing questions. Um, that hasn't been qu okay. Quickly, really, please keep it short. Uh, yeah, yeah I, quickly. I was wondering, looking back at the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan, how could they have facilitated a government which, have, which would have been more sustainable in preventing Taliban <coughs> occupation after the, their departure from Afghanistan, the U.S. departure? Thank you. Any uh, Thank you. Just. Uh, uh, when I when the U.S. came to Afghanistan, I was a student there. And I really learned a lot about liberalism and the West, Western values. But now, as I see uh, all panelists, they almost forgotten about the reality in, in, in the country. Because women are bad. Every day there is, there we, we, we see women are killed or trash in the program. The country is without constitution. And as Mr. Uh, this gentleman just mentioned, that a lot of injuries are working. But injuries are, all injuries had been converted to Taliban member. I was part of uh, a, a board member of TA, Transparency Afghanistan. I was the Secretary General of the Lions Union of Afghanistan. We tried to establish them to operate in Afghanistan. I, I will, please just don't record this for the, for the security. They, they've been asked that if there is no Pashtun for the new members, then the Minister of Economy will not allow to re re register. And I think as a, as a liberalist, I call myself a liberalist because I was, I was graduated during the US presence in, in, in the country, my perception about the West was the West value is based on human rights. And all philosophers, from John Locke, from all technical <coughs> philosophers, you see the pillar of the West is based on philosophy and human rights. Now, I, I have been witnessing none of the uh, panelists raise the, the issue of the human rights, the dignity of African people, the dignity of women. How can you imagine that with a, such a tyrannic regime who they are not allowing women, they kill people, even when there, there is people, thieves in the Congo, they kill them. Yesterday they, they killed three people. Do you think that the philosopher of the Western values as a, as a democracy, this is the only, I think, the only pillar that the, the West is based on, if you think that the West is now ignoring human rights, and they are letting the Taliban to do whatever they want. Do you think what 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 could be the future of the Western countries? Thank you so much. Thank you for those comments. Um, I hopefully you've taken note of the questions. I'll start with David. Please um, answer whichever you think you're comfortable with answering, and we will uh, finalise it and go, uh, lead to concluding remarks after that. Sure. Um, I, I guess. Strat comes, um, I, I, can, I can start on. I mean, at, at the moment, there's two areas really. You know, one is basic service delivery in the absence of 
uh, any reasonable service delivery um, by the Taliban, or particularly for women and girls. Um, you know, Stratcom's programs, and it's, they are underway already, so providing basic levels of education through radio, through internet, through social media, you know, as, a, as a sticky plaster, essentially. Um, the second sort of more provocative area, potentially, which Stratcom's could do um, stuff on, um, probably not funded by any uh, government, um, but, it, but things like um, you know, the question of what, what rights should, you know, do women actually have? Like, you know, we say they've got no rights, but actually, you know, whether it's under uh, Salafists or, 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 or even the Taliban's ideas, there are, you know, rights uh, and, and, you know, that, that women um, can have. So, you know, campaigns pushing that, or at least asking that question, um, you know, what, what, what rights should you have? Also, targeting family members. Um, I was talking to some people about this, some Afghans about this recently, and they said, we should be targeting brothers, we should be targeting fathers, saying how are you supporting your sister, things like that. Um, so there are those sorts of campaigns that just to, you know, slightly maintain a debate around, you know, what rights, uh, how can you support, you know, the woman in your environment. So I think there is potential step on stuff there. It is exceedingly difficult, you mentioned media training in country, you know, for citizen journalism. It's exceedingly difficult to do anything now that uh, touches on media development, um, anything that touches on the civil society, like in country. So there are people doing programs taking people out of the country, there are people trying to do stuff remotely, but it's, it's, it's extremely dangerous to the people that you're trying to train um, to be doing that. Um, so that, that's kind of out of, out of the question now. Um, on the US intervention, I say Afghan government was set up after this fall of, the, fall of Kabul, so I have no comments on that whatsoever. Um, and, and I think on the values question, um, and Western values, I think this goes back to the, the discussion that was surfacing in uh, you know, Gaza, Israel, uh, Ukraine, all of that. Uh, yes, the, the question of Western values based foreign policy, all of that, I think there's huge pressures on that uh, in 2024. Um, I'll leave it to that. Thank you, David. Um, the first the only one I think I will comment on is Stratcoms because I have some experience of it, but unless somebody else wants me to say something, I won't. Um, don't do it. Stratcoms, in my experience, has been an appalling failure. There's several reasons for it. One of the main reasons is that we don't understand the audience that we communicate to. Uh, I haven't got time for a personal story, but I can tell you, and I tell my students who study international relations, that the average guy on the street knows more about international relations than you do as, as graduates. And the reason is because that region, as we all know, has been uh, the, the, the subject of international relations for centuries. Uh, it's where the Great War has taken place. And they don't buy the narrative. They know what uh, uh, you know, strike comms is about. They're much smarter than we are in that respect. So um, unless you've got something genuine and different, then don't even bother. It's a waste of money. I was involved in stratcoms in Iraq. I was involved peripherally in Afghanistan. We've got to be honest. We mustn't patronize people. We mustn't sell them propaganda. And this is why I think what is happening in this um, conflict, if you're not going to call it a war, um, it's a fantastic example of where strategic comms has failed at the, uh, it's working brilliantly at the international level for those people who are putting it out. Sadly, it's working for them, but it's failing at the public level. Um, my taxi driver on the way here, or Cockney, was saying, why the hell, and he was using Cockney words, which I won't go into, um, are the politicians um, allowing this murder to carry on. So this is why I think it's a, a brilliant opportunity. So please don't use stratcoms unless you're going to tell the truth and you're going to people, treat, treat people with respect. Thank you. Keith, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Just give one, one break and I'll come to you. Yes. Um, well, I'll, 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 all of them were excellent questions and they deserve the full, full answers, which sadly we don't have uh, the, the time for. Uh, I'm an eternal optimist, and when, as you know, I'm, say I'm a former Conservative politician, you know why I mean that. 
uh, that we, we, we need to be optimistic, but I, I think I want to concentrate on what Darius said and a number of others adverted to uh, as well. And this is a, what is there going to be the solution in that part of, of the world? Well, first of all, I'm terribly fearful of theocratic states, a state that claims to be the interpreter of what the supreme deity says means that you are going to get a variety of different interpretations. And, uh, you know, Islam is no different from Christianity. You have different sects, different beliefs. You know, in the Christian church in Africa, homosexuality is still met with a death penalty. Uh, we have totally different values within, uh, within, different, within the same religion. And that's true of Islam uh, as well, particularly, obviously, the Sunni uh, and the Shia uh, divide uh, that, is, that is there. But uh, I think what is interesting is we are now seeing um, those very wealthy countries like Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman uh, and Qatar and others now beginning to flex their muscles. And that with India, they are saying we don't want to be seen as being either in the West or the Eastern camp. We want to be seen as being something totally different. And they have the money and the ability to actually create, to carve a new relationship within the world, a third pillar, if you like, just, rather just than peace and Just to yeah. make sure we're answering the questions, um, I think one of them was around Central Asia, uh, and the, uh, the other around British values and what it means for the West of all. So let's try to keep... Yes. Those well, the, mentioned, yeah, well, uh, so, so, let me just address the thing. issue of values. Please let's not call them Western values. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is accepted around the world. There was an attempt by Prime Minister Mahathir when his first time in as uh, Prime Minister of Malaysia to try to pretend they were Western values, but everybody has signed up to those values now. So they are universal. So we shouldn't call them Western values. They are universal values, and we need to stick by, by those, those, those values. But we also need to recognise that they will be interpreted in different ways in different parts of, of the world. And we have to acknowledge that cultural involvement there. And, and I believe that you know, the, the Middle East, and I'm excluding Palestine and Israel at the moment from, the, from that geographic description, but I believe that those countries will solve their problems themselves by actually realizing that they can't rely on Moscow, they can't rely on Beijing, they can't rely on Washington. They've got to actually form the solutions themselves. And I think that is coming through more and more. Thank you. Uh, yeah. um, I want to yeah, add something on uh, Darius' question about Central Asia. So I'm going to keep it very short. Um, you mentioned China. I think, yes, China kind of started the relationship with Afghanistan, first of all, by appointing their ambassador in, in Kabul. Um, so I think this is, I have to say this is a good thing for Afghanistan when we think about economically, I think. Uh, and you have to remember it might be a threat uh, for the rest of the world because they see China as, a, as one of the strongest countries in the world, playing a big role in politics. So I think, uh, so yeah, uh, that's a good thing uh, for, for them. And when it comes to Central Asia, I don't think so they will feel threatened by, um, uh, by Taliban like that maybe they're gonna have a bad influence on their region. However, I think it's, it's worth mentioning that the international community, um, you know, they have the leverage on finance, they have the leverage on recognition, and they have the leverage to influence um, Afghanistan in a positive way. For example, uh, like mentioned, like Middle Eastern countries like Qatar, um, I would say like, all the neighbors, Central Asia, they can have a positive influence on Taliban when they are dealing trade-wise. And yeah, they have the leverage to say like, okay, we're gonna do that. We're gonna we're gonna have some sort of like relationship economically, but they can have a positive influence. Like, okay, what can you do when it comes to human rights and the issues that we have in Afghanistan? And I think this is our expectation from the international community. Thank you, Yes. So. I think that we cannot solve the problems of Afghanistan in 12 style. <coughs> and especially, we are suffering for the past 46 years after the Russian invasion. 
1979. And after the Russian invasion, we lost millions of lives. And the war continues until now, which is 2024. I would like to support our campaign. I would like to say thank you very much, all of you, for attending and participating in the first uh, event that we launched the campaign for the future of Afghanistan or coalition for the future of Afghanistan. Thanks to Keep Base for uh, advising us on the base name. We proposed a number of names and sent it an email to Keep Base, and he said that it's uh, the coalition for the future of Afghanistan sounds very good, but it depends it's how we can, yeah, <laughs> uh, how we can bring the, the, the different tribes and different communities together to make sure that uh, the coalition is very inclusive. Uh, once again, thank you, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want, I want to end the panel, but we do have a woman from Afghanistan who wanted to say something herself, and I don't think it's fair for us to end the conversation on Afghanistan and women's rights without hearing from someone who's recently arrived from the country herself to say what she wants to say. Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming you want to say it in Farsi, um, and I can translate. I can translate. Go ahead. I am from the country of Afghanistan. 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 خب بازم شکر که من امروز باید کانفرانس هستم و یک گفتن یک بازوری ملس دارم که امروز او مادر و او خانم و او خان گناه نداره که این قدر جزایی ببینه که از قلم و درس تعلیم برداشن نان و قضا یک کشور اون و قلم و درس تعلیم میشه هست شکر کردیم um, evacuating me from Afghanistan. It is because of Britain that I'm safe here today. If I was in Afghanistan, I would have either been um, imprisoned at home or killed for standing up for my rights. And today, uh, what I'd like to stand up for is for the women, the mothers of Afghanistan, who all they all they want to do is feed their children and feed their families. Yeah. Well, بگذارن she says Afghanistan is currently burning, and if this fire is not um, burnt out, what is it? It's extinguished, it will worsen. And she mentioned Corona because she's saying that this um, disease of um, restricting human rights, not allowing women to study, to work, uh, is worse than coronavirus if it's allowed to settle in Afghanistan. And if it's allowed to settle, for years to come, it's something that we'll never be able to uh, extinguish or remove uh, completely. You wanted to say anything? Um, actually, I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me here, but I wanted to say thank you to Dr. Nassimi. I feel like as an Afghan, you are the voice of those Afghans in Afghanistan that they don't have a voice. And I really want to say thank you so much, and I really appreciate um, you and your family for doing this work. And uh, just on, on behalf of Afghan people that they have no voice, I just want to say thank you. Um, I won't go into final remarks. I think um, I think your name is Rona. 
I think she made Roma. Yes, um, she she uh, she uh, concluded the, the conference much better than I, I could ever do. Um, but thank you so much for, for coming. Um, I hope to see you more often in our future events. This dialogue continues, like Dr. Nsi mentioned. We can't um, find a solution for Afghanistan's problems in the next two hours. But thank you so much. There is refreshments at the back, and the panelists will be here if you have any other questions uh, for them uh, at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you.